Coming up next on Twitch, this week in computer hardware, the upgrade dilemmas. How does a three-year-old GPU stack up to the latest models? Eight gigs or three gigabytes of RAM in that new notebook? Should I build an AMD machine now or wait for Intel Sandy Bridge 2 and dual boot it on an SSD? One of the many things that may kill your new hard drive. Just kidding. Coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 107, recorded February 17th, 2011. Upgrade Dilemmas. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. My name is Patrick Norton. Joining me as always, the man, the myth, and actually I think you're probably laughing at all the rain we're getting on the West Coast, Mr. Ryan Shrout from PCPur.com. How's it going, man? It's going well. It's going well. It's nice every once in a while to have better weather than you guys. Today it was 65 degrees and sunny. Uh, very windy, but 65 degrees and sunny, so uh, much better than the multiple instances of snow we had probably just about three weeks ago, so no it's, complaints here. I, I'm actually dying because they've gotten, some of the resorts up in Lake Tahoe have gotten 40 inches of snow in the last, or I guess 35 inches of snow in the last 24 hours. How long is that course, drive for you? Uh, four hours. Um, oh, okay, that's close. Okay, it's close, but it's hard to sort of you know wrangle the the toddler and the wife and the schedule and the work thing. Um, the uh, but it's been crazy. It's been raining constantly, and I got hailed on twice yesterday, which was <laughs> <laughs> one of those exciting moments where you're like, excuse me, because I got hailed in my house and the storm blew west, and I got to San Francisco just in time to get hit by the same storm. So it's nice. It's nice. It was a surreal kind of feeling. Um, you did, is the upgrade dilemma, was that the 9800 versus modern cards? Yes, it was. Yeah. We already talked about this? Absolutely. Okay, I'm excited. we did already, I, I wanna... we need to talk about it. Oh, I thought you wanted to. I thought you wanted oh, to. Oh, no, I want to. Yeah. I'm just making sure we didn't already cover this. You seem you seem no, no, no. like you, you already you, knew the results. You teased it. You built up to it. Uh, I mean, okay. well, okay. let's just say I, I think it's safe to say, you know, a, a TI from you know last week would be considerably. I would hope it would be considerably <laughs> faster than a 9800. The it answer is, is. may surprise you. <laughs> It's so yeah. We I did a little article. I, I think I, I teased it last week where we you know we get a lot of emails. We get a lot of well emails, not a lot of voicemails or anything like that. But it's always here's my setup. Should I upgrade? Right, and it's two avenues really that we're looking at: uh, uh, CPUs or GPUs, graphics cards or main processors, SSDs and hard drives. We get a lot, but the answer is usually right. yes. You should upgrade to an SSD if you don't have one. So we took a 9800 GTX. This graphics card. Came out in April 2008. Uh, it's really a re rebadged 8800 GTS, which came out in November of 2007. So this is a fairly old graphics card. Uh, but if you look at the Steam hardware survey, still very popular. Uh, the 8800 series and the 9800 series of graphics cards were easily uh, the most sold by NVIDIA, especially that was kind of like in the heyday, you know, we talk about crisis a lot, it seems on the show, right. it was kind of the heyday of you got to upgrade your card if you want to play these new games like Far Cry and Crisis. Um, that's kind of the, the generation of those graphics cards. Here I have a much newer, much faster GeForce GTX 560 Ti. Not only have they changed their uh, naming order, but this is a high, you know, much, much faster GPU, DX11 compliant rather than DX10 or DX9 compliant part. Um, so we ran it through a whole bunch of tests. I, I, one of the interesting things that uh, I wanted to point out in the article was that if you look at the, the games we used when the 9800 GTX was released in that, in that particular review, we used the original Bioshock, the original Company of Heroes, Call of Duty 4, which doesn't sound like it's that old, but I, you know, that's, that's been out for a long time now, I guess. <laughs> Uh, Unreal Tournament 3 was still in there. Yeah, it does. Unreal Tournament 3 and Crisis, you know, uh, among a couple of other ones. Whereas now we're talking about Metro 2033, Lost Planet 2, uh, you know, games like that, Civ 5, <clears throat> uh, Bad Company 2, and Left 4 Dead 2. So th there was two, in my opinion, two classes of results here. One is where you clearly saw 
a performance difference worth the price upgrade going from a 9800 GTX to a 560 Ti. Those games were uh, Metro 2033. I mean, on the 9800 GTX, we're talking like four frames per second at 19 by 12. Not exactly <laughs> a playable result. Uh, no. An order of magnitude difference in that particular instance. Bad Company 2 saw big differences. Uh, Lost Planet 2, pretty noticeable differences. Then there were other games like the DX9 titles of F1 2010 and Left 4 Dead 2. Those two games we run in their DX9 modes. Uh, there was a huge difference between the old card and the new cards in Left 4 Dead 2. However, that difference was going from 141 frames per second down to 72 frames per second. So while we're talking about a 100% performance gap between there, 72 frames per second average frame rate at 19 by 12 is still completely playable, right? So right. if that's what you're focused on, if you still play Counter-Strike Source and you play uh, Left 4 Dead 2 and Left 4 Dead 1 with your friends and those types of games, then there's a lot of, there's still a good amount of, uh, of computing capability in a car that's three plus, three and a half years old, um, which is disappointing for NVIDIA and AMD. It's really good for consumers, but that's kind of a result of resolutions not really increasing at the speed that they had mm -hmm. in the last three or four years, right? We're kind of stuck at 1080p resolution monitors unless you're going to shell out for those big buck displays that Patrick and I are always drooling over in the 30-inch panels. Um, well, it's so funny because we went from like, you know, 1080 by 1024 was still a respectable uh, resolution for a screen five years ago, and and now you're still running into stuff that's kind of close to that on on notebooks. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, with you know, and literally, there's the the entire top, the sort of the top graphics card or two uh, in 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 AMD and Nvidia's lineup. There's really no point in getting it unless you have the rare monitor that actually has you know 2,500 pixels. You know, I mean, a 1080p monitor yep. does not need a $500 or even a $350 graphics card to actually um, do almost all of the effects you want on it. Right. Uh, it, it's, you know, bring on the 4K monitors. <laughs> right. And, that, and that's why NVIDIA created things like PhysX, where they're trying to figure out what's another way we can use the computing power of the GPU so that people will want, will want to upgrade. That's why 3D Vision exists, um, you know, where you need twice as much horsepower to render 120 frames then you do 60 frames, so here's another way we can sell more graphics cards. While my uh, NVIDIA Surround and iFinity exist, because here's how we can increase the number of pixels that need to be rendered. Uh, you know, it looks cool. It separates PC gaming, but it's also going to allow them to sell bigger, better graphics cards. Now, I did, there was one complaint, and I wanted to get your opinion on it. A complaint that mm -hmm. I got from several people about this article was that we used a high-end Core i7 CPU uh, as the test bed rather than, say, something that a 9800 GTX might still be installed in, like an Athlon 64X2 or a Phenom, right. or one of the original Phenom parts. Uh, I mean, do you have any, do you, do you think that lessens think the it, results, that it needs to be addressed in a different way, or? I, I, on some level, I mean, here's the thing, right? By using a considerably faster CPU than would have been available at the launch of the 9800, you eliminate CPU bottlenecking as possible uh, impact on the overall GPU performance, right? Because you can basically get into a situation where the CPU can't dump enough information over the bus to the GPU um, to keep the 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 to keep the game performance kind of going up with the performance of the GPU. Um, you know, I think what's going to happen is if you throw a you know freaking core two, <laughs> you know, a top of the line dual core processor, uh, right? and run all the benchmarks again, I think you're going to basically find that the games run even slower, the modern games run even slower, uh, the older games run slightly slower, uh, and the, you know, the, the, the today's graphics cards uh, take an impact on them. I think, I think you'll show that you need a faster CPU to really get the most performance out of the latest round of graphics cards, uh, and you know what, you have even lower performance than you would with, you know what I mean? It's, it, yep. it doesn't really bother me because that was always a thing where you had to be careful. There, there's been times where the, the GPUs would sort of leap ahead of CPU performance and you could literally, you know, bottleneck the performance of the GPU because the CPU couldn't pish, pixel 
code at it fast enough to actually um, take advantage of the, the GPU performance. So I, I think it's smart to render on a faster CPU, but um, that's just me. <laughs> yep. All right. So. Uh, I guess the other little bit of news, I'm not going to talk too much depth about this because I wasn't the one that wrote the review, but if you go to PC Perspective, uh, Alan wrote a review of the OCZ Vertex 3 Pro SSD. just came out this mm -hmm. morning, actually, based on the new Sandforce uh, 2000 series controllers. This is a SATA 6G SSD. Um, that means we're seeing performance out of a single drive above 500 megabytes per second. Wow. Uh, quite a few of our tests, um, which is really, really awesome. Uh, this is, they're a little bit more expensive right now because these are, like I said, they're the pro models. Uh, basically mm -hmm. what that means is that they're provisioned for a higher lifetime of reliability. So um, whereas usual, like, there's 256 gigabytes of flash in there, but they're selling it as a 200 gigabyte drive. When the consumer version comes out, that will be sold as a 240 gigabyte drive. And right. hopefully we'll have some idea of what kind of, what that actually means for the life of the drive differences. <laughs> I'm still guessing uh, that the consumer version is going to be plenty good for anybody that's listening to this show um, in terms of lifetime of, of the flash memory and that type of stuff. And the Sandforce controller actually does some really interesting ECC stuff to prevent a lot of uh, any, you know, flash dying out in that kind of way. But I mean... 500 megabytes per second uh, blows away pretty much anything else. Even the, let's see, we have a result from the Micron C300 uh, crucial right. drives that were, um, you know, set a six gigabit per second rated, but the controller is just not able to keep up with what this newest Sandforce option is doing. So that's awesome news. We also had asked, actually, I think I just posted something on the site that Intel is apparently, it was rumored to be releasing their SATA 6G SSD like March 1st. So we're, it, it's kind of like all kind of ramping together here very closely. So uh, that's good news. SSD prices will drop. These new ones will be a little bit more expensive, of course. Um, but if you like the idea of 500 megabyte per second reads and writes. <laughs> and once again, the, the CPU becomes the bottleneck as your ridiculously, insanely fast hard drive stats up. I'm, yeah, I'm I mean, actually kind of stoked for that. The, the, the issue is random access. The access times aren't improving, right? You mean... Right. Noticeably, we're still talking 0 0.1 milliseconds type of thing. <laughs> so the, you know, only when you're doing large sequential reads and writes is this going to make a huge difference or very, very, very randomized things where the higher uh, IOPS mm -hmm. per second instructions, uh, input and outputs per second will matter to you. But faster is always better. Um, so that's good. And all, by the way, all, these te all this testing was done on the Sandy Bridge platform on the SATA 6 gigabit per second channels because they still, they still have work <laughs> available so the irony there is a little bit thick so oh my goodness i i I've, i know we're supposed to talk about the, the motorola zoom tablet next but can we leap straight to nvidia working on the quad core tegra or yeah, announcing the, the quad core tegra I, I think this was kind of crazy um so they come out of nowhere at CES. NVIDIA comes out of nowhere at CES, and they're like, we're going to make the fastest ARM processors in the world, and here's our amazing Tegra 2, and it does everything the Tegra 1 was supposed to, only it's better. And now it is, is it, is it Kal-El? Is that actually yes. the name of the chip? That's, that's, <laughs> that's, well, that's the code name for the chip, but yeah. That's so awesome. Um, it's, and it's a, it's crazy. It's like a quad-core mobile processor with a 12 core nvidia gpu built on board yeah so it's <clears throat> you know they're, they're demonstrating uh i think it's the first time anybody's even shown a quad core arm mm -hmm. based processor running uh and then the 12 core nvidia gpu it's a little bit weird because i think because this is you know they're targeting the arm based processors towards a very mainstream audience um that they're they're calling them cores as opposed, I mean, they on the GPU side, we call them stream processors. NVIDIA tries right. to call them CUDA cores, but they're not cores in the same way. So if you can think of this as like 12 stream, stream processors, um, mm -hmm. one of the guys last night was trying to decide if he thought they were doing like six pixel shaders and six vertex shaders, or if they're going to do eight pixel shaders and four vertex shaders, just depending on what type of workloads they're going to see. Um, right. But the results were pretty impressive. They were playing back... 2560 by 1440 video um, 
uh, you know, on out, outputting it both on the uh, local screen of the tablet that they were demoing it on and to an external TV. So uh, and they it's, said it's the same faster person- than. Oops, sorry, I was going to say that it's that it's got better performance than an NVIDIA Ion enabled Atom box. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it does. Now, what I thought was interesting is they said it could also uh, output to a 10.1 inch tablet with a 300 DPI display, uh, which would be awesome to have, by the way. I, that would be, it would be interesting. It's almost like they're kind of like dangling it in front of Apple saying, yeah, we know you bought that company. We know you have your own accelerated version <laughs> of the ARM CPU, but look what we can do, Steve. <laughs> Did you see the uh, rest of the Tegra roadmap and all the names they associated with their uh, future processors? I, I think I'll let you read this one out because it's pretty epic, <laughs> at uh, least if so you're a comic we, book fan. We have, we have Cal-L, which is going to be out in 2011, uh, 5X the performance, then followed by Wayne in 2012, followed by Logan in 2013, and Stark <laughs> in 2014. Uh, <clears throat> and I, I think the only one that stands out there that's like if you're not a comic book fan, not a geek, Kal El is probably like, well, that seems kind of like a weird word type of thing if you don't know the Superman legends. Uh, I don't know. Was, for was, me, it was seeing Stark. I was like, wait a minute. Then I went back. I'm like, duh. <laughs> yep, yep. Superman, yep. Batman, Iron Man's secret identity. I thought that yep. was pretty freaking awesome. A little Wolverine in there for good for good measure. Now, what's interesting is that so the, the Kal El is estimated at. So these are NVIDIA estimates, so we have no idea right. exactly what it's going to mean. But 5x performance of what we have today. Uh, 2012, they're expecting 10x the performance. 2013, they're talking like 60 to 70. In Stark, we're talking 80 to 90x performance of the processors we have today. And I'm assuming that this means <clears throat> that in the same power envelopes that we have Tegra 2 at today. Otherwise, you know. It's kind of meaningless. Know, yeah, you can always make it faster if you just have a, a higher thermal envelope, right? And they even have a little line in that graph that shows where Core 2 Duo performance is. And they're saying that Kal-El is going to surpass that uh, by next year. Or actually, no, it's 2011 now, isn't it? Yeah, so this year. Yeah. Yeah, that was kind of the interesting part that they said that they were going to be sampling this uh, CPU to hardware vendors like as of today. And that they said parts were going to be available in August. It's kind of hard to believe that wow. we basically are just now getting the dual core phones, tablets out to the market. I mean, are there any even really released? I'm trying to think. I know the uh, Atrix comes out uh, in like a week or so, five days. The Zoom tablet's supposed to be out on February 24th, that type of thing. And now they're talking about quad core versions for tablets in August. So it's kind of hard to, almost kind of hard to like recommend to buy one of those. Yeah, it's kind of painful. And with all the tablets, like all the tablet information in general, it's a pun that I mean, you know, uh, Motorola announces the price for the Zoom tablet. They kind of seem like they have a release date. What did you think about the price tag on that? I mean, $800. It's it's tough to swallow that. Now, I think right. if you look at the Wi-Fi only version, um, it's kind of, it's almost in the same vein as the mm-hmm. iPad 32 gig Wi-Fi 599 for each of those. Um, but 799 is $70 more than the iPad 32 gig with 3G right. connectivity. So it's more expensive. I don't, it's not completely out of the realm of what the Apple iPad has kind of created the, the tablet market to mean. Um, I think traditionally, Apple is known as the higher priced item. So now if they're going to have a non-Apple part, a Motorola tablet, it's going to be mm-hmm. selling for more than Apple's part. It kind of puts um, Motorola and these carriers in a precarious spot that they've never been in before where they are the uh, very obviously more expensive option. I don't <laughs> think I would pay $7.99 for it. They are promising 4G upgradability that will be free. Uh, so if I could get a Verizon LTE enabled Motorola Zoom tablet for seven ninety nine. Right. I might be more tempted, but it's just like for seven ninety nine, I'm so close to a really nice laptop price. Yeah, uh, it's 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 really hard to justify it. It's it's yeah. I think it's going to be interesting to see if they drop that price or if it's something that gets considerable amount of subsidization from carriers or. That's just 
Mm, that's just a lot of money for that one. Yeah, I guess they haven't um, said if this is subsidized or not. The, the, my fear is that this is a subsidized price. <laughs> mm, yeah, I'm not even going to comment on that one. Crisis 2 leaked. EA and Crytek are pissed, I think, is, is a conservative word for that. I, I would be. I would be. Uh, if you hadn't seen this yet, Crytek or Crisis 2 kind of uh, found its way to torrent sites. Now, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not in its final revision. If you look at the videos online on YouTube of, of people playing the game, there are a lot of like textures missing. There's apparently a couple of levels missing. It's a fairly old development build, I want to say, you know, at least a couple of three months back. Uh, and, you know, the Crytek blog came out and said, look, we know that's out there. You know, even if you download it, you're not going to get the whole experience because we're not even finished with the game yet. It hasn't even gone right. gold. Um, you know, some of the videos, like the face textures on the characters don't <laughs> exist yet. They're just like big bright lights that come out of people's heads. Um, kind Man, of interesting was, there. It was funny because you, you posted a link to the, the story came off of Hexus.net, Gaming.Hexus.net. And, yeah. of course, the classic, you know, the, one of the things is is one of the commenters on the posting from, from Crytek on the Crisis blog yeah. was like, if you'd stayed faithful to your original fans and release a PC demo instead of Xbox 360 demo first, jumping onto the console money-making bandwagon explanation point, shame on you, EA. And... Um, you know, you shafted your original fans. Um, so, you know, you know, but then, of course, the other thing is, like, did maybe Crisis actually leaked this themselves? That's one of the other things that's coming out there. Um, I don't know why they would do that, because it's in such a... <clears throat> in my opinion, it's, such a, it's a little raw. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'd be one thing if, like, somehow a, a beta build of the first right. two levels leaked out, right? That was, like, kind of complete and finished. Um, you know, I mean, you know... It, the, the 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 comment there, that one poster, that's the kind of stuff that really kind of irks me because I, I I'm a PC gamer first, and you know I, I don't yeah they re, they're jumping on the money making bandwagon because they're a corporation and they need to make enough money to be able to make Crisis Three so they can actually right. deliver it to you. I understand there's a lot of uh, PC gamers, a lot of people that listen to this podcast that you know really miss the days where PC games looked and felt and were better than than mm -hmm. console games. And I, and I think we'll get there again. I just don't think we are there yet. Mm -hmm. um, and they are releasing a Crisis 2 multiplayer demo for the PC on March 1st. I don't know if they announced that after the leak or not. I don't know right. if there was any irony in that. But uh, the, the, I mean, the full game is going to be available March 22nd, so just over a month away. Um, you know, is it really worth downloading like a 9 gigabyte torrent file that you're not 100% sure what's going to be in it and installing it on your machine? I don't I don't think so. Go watch some of the YouTube videos if yeah. you're really curious, but it's one of those I things, mean, you know, this is this is this is part of the reason. I don't want to say it is the reason. It's part of the reason why a lot of publishers and developers don't want to focus solely on the PC anymore. Right. Because they can it's just kind of, get hammered so badly. I mean, it's funny cause it's like you know, usually at least the piracy happens after the game has been released, but it's, it's right. you know, I would also be curious if they have any kind of tracking in place on the on the code that will allow them to figure out how this particular uh, version of the game escaped right. out of somebody's computer and got released <laughs> on the Internet. I mean, it's also been interesting to watch speculation, like Apple's removing the software section of their store, right? Because there's better places for them to make money, and obviously they want to push mm -hmm. things through the App Store um, rather than through the the the, the Apple retail uh, retail outings. But it's interesting to watch. Like Steam is so incredibly successful. Like yeah. most of the people I know who play a lot of of PC games now do it almost entirely on Steam because um, it's so convenient and so relatively pain free. So I think it's yeah, there was, there was a, a Forbes story actually came out. I didn't have it in our show notes list here that said Steam was more profitable than Google and Apple because, uh, let's see, Valve was more profitable wow. because it generates more uh, revenue per employee. <laughs> yeah. Valve has 250 employees is all, but they generate $87.5 million in profit yearly. Uh, so it, when you look at it in a certain way, Valve and Steam... Apparently, it's more profitable than Google and Apple. On when we look well, at that's also, you know what it is? It's, it's Valve CEO probably being like, is Valve a publicly traded company or are they thinking about doing an IPO? Because <laughs> They are not publicly the, traded now, no. 
because <laughs> the the CEO is basically you know it's a, they're worth more than Google and Apple if you look at revenue divided by the number of employees. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but I bet all the employees are now looking around, going like, "Where's my raise, dude?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. When you make those announcements, you gotta expect uh, a little bit of feedback from your internals there. So, uh, time to bounce to emails. I was really interested in what you had to say about uh, Austi, who is in the market for a new PC monitor, twenty-three, twenty-four inches, and he wants to know if there's a hundred and twenty hertz PC monitors for gaming. Because I thought it was interesting, because as I was actually talking to somebody recently who had a one hundred and twenty hertz monitor, but it was being auto detected by their GPU. And we was trying to force it to run at 60 hertz and, and showing up blank. So I was like, okay, it's time to update your 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 drivers and make sure it's set correctly and use an HDMI cable if that's an option. And and uh, but I thought it was interesting. Are essentially 120 hertz PC monitors allowing you to run 120 hertz off the GPU if you can get the the game running yep. that fast? Yep. Ooh. Yep. So so 120 hertz monitors are either used for 3D vision, 3D gaming uh, with NVIDIA or AMD graphics cards because you can get dual, you know, six, you get 60 hertz per eye essentially. Uh, right. But what a lot of, you know, hardcore PC gamers are looking at is that 120 hertz display can also just display a 2D image at 120 frames per second and it actually does do that. So while most LCD monitors that you have will be, you know, when you enable VSync, they are locked at 60 frames per second or so. If you get 120 hertz display, you can go up to 120. Now, a lot of people will tell you that, a lot of people will try to tell you that anything over 60 frames per second, the human eye can't see. And I 100% don't believe that, that you Lies. can tell the difference between fast motion in a first person shooter at 60 frames right. per second than 80 or 100 frames per second. You can definitely tell a difference there. And so, you know, the, the 120 hertz monitors are definitely more expensive than the 60 hertz monitors, and they are currently kind of limited to 24 inch displays. That's, I think there might be a 27 inch from ASUS coming out uh, in the next couple of months or so, but no, no final, no, no definite word on that. Mm -hmm. I looked around, um, the problem was like, I went to Newegg and, and Amazon, and there's no classification for LCD monitors to ser search by maximum refresh rate. It's like they haven't updated their search algorithms to incorporate right. that yet. So it was Make more difficult. Sure for 24 find. inch 3D monitor, maybe. Yeah, and that's another thing is when you, I thought if I went to Newegg and typed in 3D vision in the monitor right. section, I'd get a whole list. There was only one that came up because of however it was worked into the name of the description of that, but it wasn't on the others. For example, my favorite one. Um, that I point people to is an Acer 1080p. It's the GD235HZ. Um, mm -hmm. It's a 24-inch 1080p panel. It's uh, 3D vision capable. It's 120 hertz. Uh, it's got those uh, gray to gray two millisecond response times. <clears throat> so, so pretty good. Um, and it's also one of the least expensive 120 hertz monitors. It's $349 for the 24-inch nice. display. So it's, it's expensive for a 24-inch LCD display, but uh, right. considering the LG and the ASUS models that I saw that were similar size and specs were $449 and $499, um, <laughs> you get a little bit of a, a view of, of, of why this is still my favorite. This is the one. I actually have three of those that we have here in the office for when we need to do the 3D vision surround testing. Mm -hmm. and those are the ones we use. They have a little bit uh, thicker bezels than I would like for surround capability but if you just got one monitor um mm -hmm. more, more than more than good enough for that it, it's an interesting nice. upgrade option for gamers that you know uh, don't want to go up to a 30 inch panel but they want something new on the display side uh to to keep their their pc gaming uh habit <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm kind of getting into multiple monitors, and I saw uh, recently saw an acquaintance of mine who has this completely insane three monitor system he uses for flight sims, and it's not like flight sims nice. is the most challenging for the GPU, but it was just a really, really nice setup. Yeah. Peter, Peter's got a question about headphones. He says he's got a, and this is this is a 
Peter's got some really nice, speaking of keeping your gaming going, Peter has a set of Biodynamic T1 and Sennheiser HD 800 headphones. Uh, for those of you who are not headphone uh, geeks, Sennheiser HD 100s are one of the best headphones in the world. Uh, if you're lucky, you might find them for $1,200, $1,300. They started at about $1,500, which is using with an SPL Auditor amp and a Hegel HD 10 DAC. I'm wondering where I should go from here. I've thought about recabling the HD 800 to make them balanced and getting an audio GD Phoenix amp for the T1s, buying a Woo Audio 2 tube amp to enhance their more musical sound. What do you think I should do? Maybe just save my money and get some Stax headphones <laughs> instead. And I'm, I'm still point out of my league here. I'm, I'm uh, glad you're on the show. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of laughing that you picked this question. Um, I, yeah, I was. I, my, I read this, and I, my, my immediate reaction was, it's nice to see somebody with more money tied up in headphones and amps and DAX than I have. Because um, <laughs> this this guy, Peter, I, I salute you. You're a serious, serious uh, headphone geek. And I got to say, um, you know, we were just talking about headphones on Techzilla because we had somebody with a, a the $200 version of this problem where they had a new set of headphones. They were thinking about getting a new set of headphones, you know, in, in for kind of normal people, you know, somewhere between two hundred and three hundred dollars, you get an unbelievable amount of performance for music out of a set of headphones, and you can step mm -hmm. up that, or even considerably less expensive headphones, like seventy-five bucks, sixty-five bucks. Uh, Great OSR sixties are one of the best audio. You know, like really, it's like the greatest piece of entry-level audio file gear out there. They are fantastic headphones for the money. Um, they will, you know, you can. You don't need a headphone amp, but they'll open up a little bit for a headphone amp. Um, my HD, uh, my HD 880s, or so my Biodynamic 880s. Um, you know, mm. if you attach those to a headphone amplifier, um, they really, really, the sound kind of tightens up. It gets pretty amazing. Um, you know, but you're there, man. The Sennheiser HD 800s, Biodynamic T1, going to balanced input on the HD 800s. You're, you're kind of like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. And I, I admire the search for audio perfection that you want to find the right. best possible combination. Um, you know, but it's kind of like, you know, once you've got 4X anti-aliasing or 8X anti-aliasing on your 1900 by 1080 screen, you're kind of done. <laughs> you add right. another GPU, well, go find a 30-inch monitor that's, you know, running at like 2560 by 1080 or something. You've just, you're in overkill territory. Something sure. that kind of, you know, I, I'd rather, you know, I would say... Take a really close look at your source material. If you haven't, you know, rip all your CDs to a lossless codec. Start looking at hdtracks.com. This is something anybody who, you know, you don't have to, you don't need a thousand dollar pair of headphones to start playing around with HD tracks. Um, they do lossless hmm. files like 96, 24, 96 K 24 bit files um, of actually some obscure stuff, but some really popular albums are available on there where they've remastered it and made it available at a much huh. higher resolution. Um, at sampling rate than you would normally find from a CD, and they sell those online. Um, you know, if, if you're getting to the point where you're looking at analog, you know, if Lloyd Case, uh, uh, formerly of Extreme Tech, uh, <coughs> he freelance writers now, he, he's funny, like I joked about a, a tube amplifier, a headphone amplifier, and, and he's an engineer of the old school variety, and he was he was just horrified at the idea. He just thinks, you know, audiophile, the, he, he gets... No, I take that back. He just refuses to believe that there's any reason to ever go to tube-powered gear. <laughs> so I'm a little tainted by that. Right. Um, you know, I would, I would say, uh, yeah, if you want to get the, if you're looking for an excuse to get the Stax headphones, get the Stax headphones. I would say, you know, start thinking about going analog if you haven't already. Getting your favorite albums on like 180 gram vinyl, getting a decent uh, turntable, um, exploring the sort of digital versus analog sound quality. And dude, I will totally take the HD 800s if you get the Stax and don't want them anymore. Uh, you just need to get rid of those. <laughs> And check out Can Jam if you haven't heard about it. If you're a HeadFi geek, um, the HeadFi crew, HeadFi.org crew, which is a really amazing online resource for headphone enthusiasts at all price levels, uh, entry level all the way up through out of control. Uh, and Can Jam is a gathering they put on uh, every year. I've, I've gotten to attend one or two of them where they 
get a lot of vendors together and a lot of headphone geeks and a lot of audio geeks all in, in one hotel and you get to try out everybody's gear. You get to try out headphones, headphone amps, DACs. Um, and that I would highly recommend, like maybe forget about buying another $1,500 amp and, and buy yourself an airplane ticket and a $40 ticket to go see Can Jam and, and go get your audio nerd on <laughs> in the company of others. So nice. that's well probably done. more than anybody in the audience wanted to hear about that. <laughs> well, at least there, there was probably one person that wanted to hear that. So we're, we're, we're good. We're good. Uh, let's see. Email from Scott about upgrading a Fusion notebook. These new ones that are just coming out. It says, first, I'd like to say he's a big fan of the show. Keep up the good work. Looking to buying the new HB Pavilion DM1Z Ultra Portable Laptop. It has the new AMD Fusion APU. Off the shelf, it comes with 3 gigabytes of RAM. But for $150 more, I can upgrade it to 8 gigabytes. Is it worth upgrading for that price? as it will be my daily driver. Syncing <clears throat> iTunes and Zoom with iPads and phone, etc. Streaming Netflix via HDMI to HDTV. Browsing the web and playing low-end games like Torchlight. No hardcore gaming. So my question is, should I go for the 8 gigs of RAM? Is the price right? Will 8 gigs of RAM even benefit me for what I am doing? Keep up the good work. Um, <clears throat> wow. Uh, you know what? At first, I was kind of like... The idea of putting eight gigabytes of memory in uh, a, a Fusion APU-based system seems like <laughs> seems like overkill, yeah. uh, and it probably still is. So we're talking about. I looked up the machine. It's a it's a it's the dual core AMD Fusion E three fifty processor, uh, Windows seven Home Premium. It has mm -hmm. the obviously the integrated Radeon HD graphics in that. Uh, it's an eleven point six inch seven twenty p display. Um, so that is kind of, that's like kind of one of the key things to point out is it, it's a 1280 by 720 monitor. It's 11.6 inches and it's a dual core uh, AMD Fusion E350 processor. I, my initial, my gut reaction here is that three gigs of memory is probably going to be more than adequate for the types yeah. of things you're going to do on here. If you like to keep like Photoshop and you know Premiere open simultaneously because you're working with 1080p video and right. editing gigantic 25 gigabyte stills um, or you know 300 megabyte stills, then yeah, eight gigabytes amazing. Or if or if you keep 42,000 high end applications running simultaneously <laughs> and you want Windows 7 to cache your stuff uh, in main right. system memory so it launches really fast. But man, yeah, I mean, cause it, it's, it's like overkill to get that much memory yeah. for a processor that is a good processor. It's better than the Atom options that we have in the same price point. But I mean, you really shouldn't be running Photoshop and Premiere and that type <laughs> of stuff at the same time on a system like this. Um, right. So I would say, I mean, it's always something you can go back and do later. It'll probably be a little bit more expensive. $150, the other thing is $150 to go from three to eight gigs of memory seems really cheap uh, in a laptop, actually. Yeah. Um, well, cheap in a laptop, but it's still like, a third of the price of the, the it's a 30% right. increase. It's, it's 30% the cost of the base price of this notebook. Right. Um, Going from, you're basically taking it from 450 to 600 uh, bucks. So I, I would say, I would say I would pass on it for now. I think you'll be more mm -hmm. than happy with that. I, I'm actually impressed. This is the first time I'd looked up this particular system. It says it quotes on their website uh, with this, with the six cell battery up to nine and a half hours of battery life. That's amazing. Uh, which, if it gets anywhere close to that, is really, really impressive. So maybe we're actually getting to the promises of those AMD <laughs> Fusion APUs after all. All day computing. That would be nice. Exactly. Yeah, if, and if you really want to spend the money, uh, I would say upgrade to a faster GPU or a larger screen. Or, or if you do like the sort of portable notebook, get yourself an SSD and save yeah. yourself even more battery. Yep. Michael's got a comment about the 2D vertical sync problem from last week. He says, I want to start by saying thanks for your help, but I have tried vertical sync on in games before, and it helped. So I did what you said in the NVIDIA control panel, forced vertical sync, then rebooted using VLC. I took a snapshot of Jim Louderback as he is exiting the screen. <laughs> Hi, Jim. That's my boss, by the way. Or I should say my boss's boss's boss. And then like the image I sent before as an example, this image was not modified. I only had the card since July 29, 2010, bought it new from Amazon. 
And it does say free 24-7, 365 tech support and lifetime warranty. I think the card Eight. doesn't work right. Is there a way to get a replacement card since BFG is gone? Ouch. Or should I just start <laughs> looking for a GTX 460 or 560 and take the loss on the 260? Oh, boy. Yeah, I think I think you're going to be SOL on the uh, getting a replacement from BFG since they're they're out of business. I mean, it might be worth going to their website. Uh, I guess you know we could check that and see if there's any kind of if anybody has taken over their support. Um, no, BFGTech.com goes to a forbidden page. So, yeah. not not that good look sucks. there. I did I did kind of search around and found um, if you look up if you Google uh, vertical sync. 2D, you get some issues here because I know this is something we were kind of debating last week. It was like I've never really seen like a vertical sync effect a 2D image before. Um, there was a thread at rage3d.com forums that I found that had a couple of quick suggestions I'll throw out here. Windows graphics acceleration is turned off. You might want to turn it on. Uh, arrow, thing, things like that. Uh, the drivers are not installed properly or have gone haywire. Uninstall the driver using something like driver cleaner and reinstall the graphics drivers and see if you see that. Um, uh, there is a driver slash software that, uh, there's a driver software that causes 2D corruption, delay and tearing running in the background. So um, basically, you know, look through your process stack in Windows Task Manager and close everything that you do not know what it is. Uh, any background applications running and see if that affects anything as well. Um, those were kind of the only solutions that I found a lot of it of right. reinstall your drivers. I don't know if he's already tried that before. Um, but you know, if you're using the drivers out of the box for that graphics card, they're way old. So make sure you're <laughs> going to NVIDIA.com and getting whatever the latest is for that graphics card. Um, yeah. Email from Mike about using AMD instead of Intel. It says, during show 106, AMD alternatives to Intel Sandy Bridge ships were briefly discussed. This was close to home for me as I was just about to start building a Sandy Bridge-based system when the whole snafu over incompatibility with chipsets came up. Now I learned that Intel is proposing two new designs during 2011, Ivy Bridge and LGA 2011 or Socket R chips. So why rush in and build something based on Intel now? Given AMD's top-end six-core processors and their, and their declining prices, what am I giving up if I decide to build a high-end system around AMD instead of Intel this year? I'd look for equivalent motherboards from ASUS, Gigabyte, or MSI, along with matching video cards in the $250 to $400 price range. I do some gaming, processing, and converting of video files, flash to MP4, and general computer stuff that I want a good, fast computer with mild overclocking. Um, so yeah, this is, I think, the dilemma that a lot of PC enthusiasts uh, are in right now where, okay, I, I can't build an Intel system. Is it worth it to build an AMD system? And I think when you start looking at the prices of the six core processors from AMD, they are really, really, really compelling uh, for, that, for that field. The only thing um, that kind of has me on the edge here is uh, we, we know that Lano is coming out soon. That is their desktop CPU GPU combo chip their fusion APU for for the desktop market that will work I believe in the processor or in the sockets that you have processors of today or you have motherboards of today rather um, What I don't think will work is the the upcoming bulldozer chips. They will work in the am3. This is really common am3 plus processor socket which will be coming out very soon on existing chipsets. So very soon you'll be able to buy a motherboard for, AMD, for an AMD platform that will work with today's six core and quad core processors as well as tomorrow's eight core bulldozer parts. So that's kind of compelling as well. Uh, I know they're trying to kind of get those things out and available as soon as they can to take advantage of this break. Um, that being said, I still, you know, if you want to build a system today, I don't think you're giving up much by choosing to go to an AMD platform, using uh, an 890 AMD motherboard, using uh, six core processors. I mean, for what he's talking about doing, some gaming, um, regular processing, converting video files, general computer stuff, I think you're gonna be great for that. You know, I mean, a six core processor, you know, running stock, whether or not it's overclock is gonna do just fine for any type of PC gaming. Uh, he says he's gonna spend $254 on a graphics card anyway. So that's gonna take over a lot of that workload. Um, I, do you, I was going to say, do you feel like for a, you know, 
Core i3, Core i5, I think any of the AMD processors are a pretty good match. How about at the top of the line 6 core versus a, a top of the line Core i7? Uh, if we, I mean, if we look at the Sandy Bridge processor performance, if, if you look at just the performance, mm -hmm. um, the Intel, the Intels are going to win. If you look at the right. benchmarks for things like video transcoding, uh, you know, audio encoding, uh, 3D rendering, that type of stuff with like Pavre and Cinebench, um, the, the Intel processors are definitely going to come out ahead. Now, what you got to look at is the price to performance ratio, which is, is kind of one of those difficult to analyze things, right? Because the AMD parts are going to be priced. So you're going to be able to get like an AMD 6-core part for the price that mm -hmm. you would be able to get like a Core i5 Standy Bridge part. Right. Um, you know, so, you know, AMD knows that they don't have a performance edge in any of these particular areas if we just look at raw numbers. So they price their parts accordingly and take advantage of their, uh, I don't know if I'll say ability to price cut, uh, price cut, but their need to price cut and take advantage of that and, and get consumers into their platform. Um, it's, I, I still think the AMD option is, is very compelling for, you know, all, all of those reasons. I, and, you know, and there's, there's a four week break where you can't buy an Intel part. So unless mm -hmm. you definitely want to buy something from a dead processor socket, 1156, or <laughs> you can even go back to, you know, socket 775. Uh, I think they still sell a lot of that stuff. So uh, I, I think AMD has a pretty good opportunity here. I don't, I would have no, like I have no reason to tell anybody, nah, you know what, you should wait for Intel to come back rather than uh, purchase an AMD system. Um, I'm, yeah, I, I, at this you're point, I, I don't think you're going to go wrong. Yeah. Norm's got a question about building a portable main machine that connects to a TV. He needs some advice. He says, I've been shopping for mini ITX motherboards with HDMI ports, but I cannot find any mention of whether or not I will get audio signal with my video. It is nowhere in the product specs and Newegg reviews. My Google Foo has found nothing. Can you clear this up for me? <laughs> Also, I see a lot of these mini ITX boards have no fan, just large heat sinks. Do I still need to provide airflow across the heat sinks? Um, let's do this one backwards. First of all, the 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 amount of the the processors that were used for all of the games, either basically the processors that powered the games that you're running an emulator for, the MAME emulator for, used such a tiny amount of processor power compared to what you're available or what's available today that even with even with the worst possible MAME, uh, the worst possible MAME encoding ever is still going to run in like the least. I should say that no matter how inefficient the the emulator is run, you're still going to have a zillion times more computing power in like a Core 2 Duo or an Atom right. Ion than you actually need to play Tapper, for example, or <laughs> Asteroids, or yes. you know, choose your favorite MAME uh, game of choice. So. You know, it's your your machine should not be your your main machine is not going to be uh, you know it's it's just it's just not going to struggle. The CPU is not going to throttle up. It's not going to even if it does. The thermals on the atom parts are so small that the the passive heat sinks will be there. That said, if you think like you're going to be watching a lot of Netflix video, you know, 720p on an HD TV, and you're paranoid, then yeah, it's you should have some kind of ventilation inside the box to let the heat out. Um, but again, they don't generate a right. huge amount of heat. Um, the HDMI audio thing, my concern actually is, is we did a crazy month-long uh, MAME cabinet build on system a few years ago. And what was more interesting was dealing with MAME community. I, 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 my question is whether or not the MAME emulator is going to communicate properly with um, the HDMI audio at the uh, sort of at the driver level. Whether than whether or not the like an Nvidia Ion motherboard will actually support HDMI audio. Um, what you could do is is look for supported products. Uh, I would say look for supported products on Blu-ray that 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 promise to handle full Blu-ray HDMI audio over the HDMI port um, from that the 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 Ion boards, and mm -hmm. then kind of work backwards from there. Um, I I would think almost any of the Ion boards that are out now should allow you to do audio over HDMI. Um, yeah. You know, there's no reason they shouldn't because they're being a lot of them are being used for home theater PCs. You might want to check uh, mini-itx.com, a couple of the resources there. But um, you know, just because the hardware can do it doesn't mean you'll actually get it to work properly um, in the main configuration emulator. is always a pain, isn't it? Yeah. 
Um, cause MAME, it's like, it's amazing to see all these games come to life when you have all the ROMs available on a system, but it, it can also be incredibly frustrating, um, jumping through the hoops to get this unbelievably primitive game code, uh, inside these really cool emulators to actually run on machines that are so ridiculously fast compared to what they actually used back in the day. So I, I think you're good with the heat sinks. You know, a, a fan to ventilate a case is always a good idea if there's decent airflow. Um, and um, unfortunately, I think you're going to have to, you know, buy a late model mini ITX board, load the operating system, and load the main emulator and see if it works that way and, and kind of work your way backwards from there. Yep, yep. Uh, let's see, I'm going to jump down here to an email from Jeff about fixing the noise on his machine. He says he owns an mm -hmm. HP XW8000. Uh, which has two 3 gigahertz Xeons, 3 gigs of memory, and a 1 terabyte 7200 RPM internal drive, uh, plus a USB Drobo for storage. However, the noise generated on this P is extremely loud. I'm guessing 60 plus decibels, but I'll have to get a meter to find out for certain. I discovered that the case fan is 120 millimeters, so he's ordered a replacement uh, fan, which maxes out at uh, 1300 RPM, 19 decibels. However, as long as I'm modding this PC, do we have any recommendations for replacing the stock HP CPU fans? He tends to use PC for audio recording, and currently it has been so loud that he can hear the PC another room away over the sound of his apartment's forward-facing or forced air heating. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty loud. I know it's not the fastest machine around anymore, but I'm saving my pennies for a dual Xeon Mac to replace it. My main, my main apps are Pro Tools, Cubase, Photoshop, etc. Thanks again for the Drobo tip, by the way. My data is worth more than either of my computers, which is uh, wow. important, good words to live by. I had to do some research on this server. So an HP XW8000 is kind of an old uh, Xeon server. It's based on a motherboard with an MPGA604 socket that was released mm -hmm. in 2003. Um, and then after I had that information, we kind of did a, a quick search around, and there are precious few heat sinks still around that will support that particular socket. However, I did find two. Uh, one is uh, at acousticpc.com. It's the, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, Noctua uh, brand, which is the same brand of the, of the new fan he purchased. Noctua NHU12PX Xeon CPU cooler. And um, they obviously take into account noise. It's, uh, they even say the fan, it's 120 millimeter fan included with sound optimized blade geometry, which sounds really <laughs> fancy, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, supports LGA <laughs> 771 and the MPGA 604 Intel Xeon 5000 and 7000 series CPUs. So this sounds like probably his best bet. They're not cheap, um, 65 bucks a piece. So he'll have to get two of those. Uh, but I really wasn't able to find, but I think one or two other heat sinks that definitely supports this platform. Um, right. not being able to look at the motherboard directly. I'm a little, I might be a little concerned that the heat sink on this is big, too big. Like if the processor sockets are really close together, that might interfere with that. It does give dimensions on their page. Uh, and there's different orientations and that kind of stuff that you can look at. So you can see, look inside your case and try to get an idea of what it is. But if you go to Acoustic PC and look up the NH-U12P, it looks like a good option. <laughs> Maybe your only option. And it's one of those things where I'd say, like, buy it soon because heat sinks for processor sockets uh, that were released in 2003 are going to be very hard to come by. Yeah, this, it's, a, it's kind of a miraculous that you can still buy one today. Yeah, I thought so. so. Wow. So, do we have time for one more question, or should we yeah, cut sure. it? Do you want to do dual booting on an SSD or CPU overclocking? Uh, let's do the the dual booting SSD. I, you know, I, that straightforward <laughs> answer there. We can we can get to that one. Calder says, I have a question about dual booting on an SSD. I just purchased a solid state drive and installed Win 764 bit on it, ultimate, if that's important. However, for the last forever, I've dual booted with Ubuntu and occasionally different distros. I honestly don't use them a ton, so I can get by without dual booting, but I do really like the option of going into a full Linux install 
without the subsequent slowdowns of a virtualized system with virtual box. Is it a problem to do a boot on an SSD? Does it lessen the lifespan of the drive? How does trim work in that situation? I know the modern Linux kernel supports the trim command. I so this one's Go ahead. I was going to say it shouldn't impact the, the SSD's lifespan shouldn't be impacted at all. Um, I, I would get a little nervous about trim being used by both uh, Windows and Linux, but that's because I'm paranoid, not because there's any real reason <laughs> to worry about that. Yeah. But it, it's a hard drive. It should not impact your ability to dual boot at all, I thought. Nope. Nope, it, yeah. it, it, should, it should work just fine. And Trim actually works on a partition basis. Ah. So uh, because you have a, a separate Windows section and a separate Linux section, you know, it will be able to take advantage of that type of, uh, of stuff inter interdependently. Um, nice. Alan is actually messaging me here in my uh, chat window. It says, increased wear due to the additional OS and fragmentation from additional random writes taking place, but not to a point where you really worry about it killing your drive off. Uh, other than normal uses would do so. Well, but uh, would, wouldn't you normally be using operating system on Windows? If I mean, like, I don't know, would it be increased wear because of there's more writing being done to the scratch file by each operating system in different parts of the drive? Because normally you'd think yeah. if you know if he wasn't using Linux, he'd still be using Windows, right? Well, remember, with an SSD, there's no parts of the drive, right? Part of the wear leveling right. algorithms on these SSDs is it's, it's, it's going to write things to different flash locations uh, in as spread out a way as possible. So Windows will still do that, or Trim will still do that, or the internal algorithms of the SSD will still do that, regardless of which operating system is actually running. So I, I think you'll still be using, uh, you know, the, the same flash capability in the same way, right? So, I mean, even if you're running Linux, you're still going to be using the same type of flash area on the SSD as you would when you're running Windows right. too. So, I, short in short, I don't think it's a problem. Alan right. doesn't think it's a problem. Uh, <laughs> and it's probably going, you're probably going to want, just love running Linux on an SSD just like you did uh, enjoy running Windows on an SSD. So, I'd almost say the biggest issue is wanting a bigger SSD and having to spend more money uh, to have space for everything you want to put on the SSD. That is true. Um, That's always cool. the case. That's always the case with SSDs. Oh, my goodness. Next week, we will answer the Silverlight responses, and I'll, I will talk about uh, video acceleration and video acceleration because, you know, <laughs> yeah. Silverlight 3 did some things involving GPU acceleration and uh, we'll talk about CPU overclocking too. Twitch yep. at twit.tv is the email. Um, Ryan, what's coming up on PC Per this week? Although I got to say, if you haven't read it, I would start with the upgrade dilemma. It's a good, it's, it's a good uh, nostalgic look back at the way things used to be, uh, so to speak, in the, in the world <laughs> of hardware. Uh, this week we have uh, quite a bit of stuff coming up. We've got some new notebook reviews coming out, of in, including a full review of that Toshiba AMD Fusion single core 15 inch laptop uh, that I kind of briefly talked about last week. That has a full review ready to go live. We also have, uh, as I was kind of teasing with here, more SSDs, including the consumer version of the Sandfor 6 gig controller and Ooh. possibly the Intel 6 gig controller or 6 gig drive at least. Um, I don't know if that'll be between now and next week, but that will be coming up here in the very before, hopefully before the end of February. Nice. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm trying to hold for another like three months before I buy a new notebook SSD. Cause Good idea. you know, <laughs> everything's getting faster. If I can just wait till the end of this year, everything will yep. be stupid fast. So Techzilla, so, I know you saw you said you had a good headphone type of roundup or discussion there. We had a discussion, we had an interesting conversation with a, 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 a somewhat less expensive conversation about upgrading your headphones and and I can uh, appreciate that. Uh, yeah, we also had a we had a uh, we had an incident involving Nerf guns. Veronica went insane uh, on the <laughs> set with a I Nerf gun. I saw that today. on uh, somebody's Twitter feed about a Nerf gun fight going on at the Revision Three uh, offices. I'm not sure. One of the shows, I, I, I got to find and figure out which show is actually doing it. Because I all of a sudden, somebody was like, here, take this, handed me a Nerf gun, said we need more footage. And all of a sudden, I was battling two of my coworkers in a hallway. Um, <laughs> we don't do anything fun like that here. 
Yeah, we never do anything like it's kind of funny because apparently there's like nine people, nine people in the office have bought Nerf guns and none of the Techzilla team. So Roger and I were examining the Nerf guns, deciding which ones were the most effective and the easiest to manipulate to load additional ammo into. And I'm like already pulling them apart to figure out where we can modify them to make them work better. Yeah, I, really I have to admit, uh, a couple of months ago, my friends and I went to like a Walmart at 2 a.m., bought a bunch of Nerf guns and had Nerf gun fights. Um, and we're like 20, some late 20s. It's a little embarrassing, <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. It's amazing. I, Nerf guns, it's, it's, I, I had to say it was really kind of a tension reducer to loft like 18 <laughs> darts into, into Roger, my beloved producer and coworker. Yeah. Um, <laughs> nice. Nice. But yeah, we've, we've got a, we've got a good steady cam hack. You can turn some paracord in a, in a, uh, <laughs> eye bolt into a sort of a pocket friendly portable monopod. And we talk about Memtest 86 a bunch and why uh, memory goes bad. Because we had a very, very funny email from a guy who was like, I don't understand how memory could have died. And I was like, it's okay, dude. It happens. <laughs> Usually because yeah, yeah, you have yeah. a cheap power supply. Oh, and I should point out, we got a really good interview with uh, with uh, Kyle Bennett from Hard OCP where he gives us his picks on uh, PSU's power supply units and cool. how they do their power supply testing down there. Very so cool. That's coming up Tuesday on Texilla. So Twitch is coming back to you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, I'm Patrick Dorton. I'm Ryan Trout. And do us a favor, email us twitch at twit.tv, and we will see you next week. Bye.